All right, so Apocalypse of the Gods, chapter number four, and we have the conclusion of round number one in this chapter. Much quicker round than the usual record of Ragnarok length, which we talked about beforehand. It has to probably go at a quicker pace if it is gonna end before the main tournament of Ragnarok ends to leave the ambiguity if one of these guys could potentially get into the tournament or not. With that said, let's get into it. Where we left off last chapter was, of course, Ra destroying Ku. A full one-sided affair really but there was hope at the end for Ku's awakening as Morgan had alluded to she had said that he is not done yet this fight is far from over we start with that follow-up with some narration that says the legend of hero Ku Kalin and the warrior goddess Morgan is one that was told in the Ulster cycle a collection of oral folk stories in the Celtic region. There are many versions with different variations, as many as there are narrators that have told these stories. Nevertheless, there also exists a truth that only those who starred in these myths and legends know of. It's giving us a shot of Morgan who has a grin on her face. She says, you still have more, isn't that right, Hound? You're the only warrior that's ever managed to beat me. So confirmation that Ku has defeated Morgan in the past. She's part of the tournament as well, so that's pretty interesting. Potentially they're setting up a rematch later. Maybe we'll see what happens. The reason she said Hound is because Ku Kalin translates as Hound of Kulin. When she says this, we see that Ku is rising from the ashes, standing in the crater that Ra left him in. Ra is absolutely dumbfounded at the fact that Ku can even still stand. He says, how can he still stand? The damage I've dealt to him should be more than his mind and body can bear. I should have beaten him by now. His thoughts were a simple presumption, says the narrator, but they were pure objective truth, proper of an elite warrior. This made no sense. How was Ku still standing? Then we get, perhaps in my opinion, the best panel of the chapter, where as Ra is pondering what's happening, this giant hand, looks like a goblin's hand or like a demon's hand, rises up and like overtakes Ra. He's completely shocked. Now, this isn't a real hand, but this is like kind of serving as the embodiment of Ku's aura at the moment. Ra Urakti was certain that the strange phenomenon is without a doubt his divine power. And we see that Ku is undergoing some sort of transformation. So obviously, his weapon last chapter started crawling over to him. It seems like it's awakening in a sense. It's like sprouting. He's now picked up the weapon, which is a spear and his face has gone full demonic. His teeth have turned into sharp fangs. He's bulked up considerably in terms of muscle mass. It looks kind of like Nosferatu Zod from Berserk, and he's prepared to launch this weapon like a javelin. Ra realizes that this is something innate within the body of Kukulin. In other words, obviously his divine power. After that, the exchange that followed this revelation lasted less than five seconds, and the winner was decided. Insane. So Ku cocks back. He takes this wide step where he gets as much momentum as possible and he throws this spear. Within the Ulster cycle, there's always something common about it. In any tale from any narrator, that which was thrown by Kukulin, that is the cursed spear that always hits and kills. Gay bull. We get panned in shots of Zeus, Suzaku, Wukong, who's up next, and Morrigan, all taken aback by what they're seeing. And of course, we finally get the reveal of what his weapon is named. This is what a lot of people have been Waiting on the confirmation that that is the spear. Some people thought the spear was inside the log. No, the log itself is the spear, which is insane because he obviously buffed up and he started using it as a spear. He throws it like a javelin, right? So he throws this spear at Ra, and in that brief instant before it struck, the decision taken by Ra was to free his maximum power. He was able to boost out of the way almost like jetpack, so he dodges the spear. That was the right move, says the narrator. It possessed a power impossible to defend against, so it was better to dodge. That was an opinion shared by the strong as well as by the weak in the crowd. But we cut back to Ra, and Ra is absolutely shocked. And it's almost like a parallel to that panel where Ku was shocked that Ra had appeared behind him. Now the roles have been reversed. Ra, who just dodged that attack, completely got blitzed, perception blitzed, by Ku. It's a situation where he realizes far too late that Ku is now behind him far into the air. While that which was supposed to have been avoided was thrown, Ku had jumped without being seen. So this is a perception blitz pretty much. You could potentially probably argue he's distracted by having to dodge the other thing, but I could see people being able to argue this is a perception blitz because Ku jumped from his position, completely got behind Ra without Ra being able to detect it. Maybe you go in the diversion route if you don't want to get crazy because the perception blitz is pretty insane, but this is pretty impressive for Ku, nonetheless, whatever interpretation you want to take. 
The narrator basically says that thanks to his throw being so fast, like that's how he was able to jump without being seen. So maybe you go more into that diversion route, like where it's like that happens, but then he'd still have to be fast enough to move basically alongside the spear throw and be able to catch the spear midair. You get this crazy panel of Koo. He's making that same pose he was making on the ground, like kind of cocking back for max momentum, but this time in the air. But only this time, the second attack wasn't a throw. And we see him do something with his leg where he actually like comes down and kicks the spear as it's going up apparently. And essentially what happens is, just as the Ulster cycle says, the cursed spear that always hits and always kills, gay bull, the meaning of its name is, belly spear. There's also a note that says it can also be translated as the spear that expands or as the spear that inflates. We basically see that the reverberations from Ku's kick apparently blow up this log like a damn balloon. So that's like the premise here. It's supposed to inflate like a balloon. And I don't know what the fucking physics are <laughs> behind this. It looks like it's gonna be some kind of magic or I don't know specifically, but Ku's force is apparently supposed to have made this happen as Ra looks up in astonishment as Ku essentially destroys his own weapon. So he kicks it into all these pieces, it expands and then it explodes with like a rain down of javelins. It's almost like that Honor the Fallen, I think is the name of it in God of War, where he throws the spear up into the air and then all that, like the special runic attacks, all those spears come down. So essentially what happens is that Ra's caught in this blast radius. There's nothing he could do. The projectiles are unavoidable. It covers so much area. The area of effect is insane. Gay Bulg is, in other words, a means to turn into fragments. It turns into these projectiles and Ku, we get a full shot of his demonic form. This is his ultimate technique, only made possible by this transformation, this berserker form that was alluded to. It's not like this is something that they didn't tell us was gonna happen earlier. He was called the berserker. We saw the legends of him having a berserker form. So this makes sense. The power increase is crazy. We don't really know why he got more powerful. We don't know if it was a situation where it was like, because of the damage or I've seen some people say he's similar to Hulk so was it just him getting more frustrated and angry wish we got some explanation but we don't so he kicks the spear down Ra tried to counteract it with his prominence field maximum output so he's trying to burn it at this point as well his prominence field is what slows people down weakens them burns them and that even at maximum output could not stop it the spears come down they pierce Ra once it had been thrown it could neither be avoided nor blocked in any tale from any narrator in all the tales of the Ulster cycle there's always something in common about it it's the curse spear that always hits and always kills and all of Ra's female goddesses from the Egyptian pantheon are basically disgusted they are completely in shock at what has happened to Ra, Ares, Hermes even looks surprised, Wukong looks pretty satisfied with what he's seeing, and so does Zeus, and of course Morgan has a demonic grin on her face as she was expecting this all along. Interesting note about Morgan is that like you can see scars all over her body, so potentially maybe those scars came from this attack. It's weird though that they keep saying it's the attack that always hits and always kills, because if she was hit by the attack, she obviously lives, so that's obviously false. Maybe Ku beat her without having to use this ultimate technique. Who knows? Maybe she has a way to counteract it or resurrect or something. We'll obviously find out, but it's interesting to note that, especially with what's about to be shown. Yara screams out, it's all over. First match, round one, Ku Kalin versus Ra Arakdi. Match duration, 15 minutes and 13 seconds. Winning technique, Gay Bolg. Winner, Ku Kalin. And we get this amazing panel of all those javelins piercing through Ra as he sits atop the mountain of spears. Almost, it looks like the fucking throne in Game of Thrones. I don't know how he's at the top of it. It's a little bit weird. He probably should be at the bottom, right? I don't know. It's cool nonetheless. I think Ku's exit frame is really cool. He looks like a beast walking away, but it's a pretty short chapter to be honest. And honestly, I think that the ending was a little bit quick obviously we talked about this though it's going to be quicker rounds but i kind of felt like ra got a lot of build up i would have liked to see more of a back and forth at least ra having some kind of interaction with this demonic form before this ultimate technique finished it off potentially at least one more chapter of the fight i do think it kind of makes ra look like a jobber he basically got destroyed and you could argue he got blitzed badly that's kind of the situation maybe ku's just him maybe ku's just a beast like this we'll see obviously this is going to be a different type of tournament so some people have been upset because they think that some characters are going to get favoritism and potentially have main character syndrome type thing where ku he's very prominent front and center on the covers like the one that was for the announcement like here you can see and a lot of people kind of thought like they really hoped that he wasn't going to be the main character going forward for the tournament because he had that kind of energy and 
round one. But you gotta understand that this is more so a style of tournament like Kengen, where Record of Ragnarok, we get one-off fights. So you don't necessarily have to have people still invested in characters that were in the initial fight because at the end of it, one fighter is gonna die, one fighter is gonna win, and then we're gonna move on to two brand new fighters. In this tournament, we are going to have to have recurring characters. So you kind of have to treat them a little bit different where from a writing standpoint, there kind of has to be arcs and stories throughout the tournament because we're gonna see these guys continue to fight as this goes. So now we're gonna have Ku going into another round. We've got the reveal of this technique. So obviously they also can't show us every technique at their disposal because they're building up to fuller fights later so i can see why a lot of people this won't be their cup of tea i personally am still going to enjoy it i think and i'm really looking forward to next month's chapter because guess who's fighting soon wukong he's fighting prometheus we haven't got prometheus design yet so this is going to be a cool fight and if wukong wins which i think everybody pretty much thinks is likely wukong versus ku is going to be a very unpredictable matchup in round two so i'm still excited i think people got to give this a chance and understand that it's going to be a very different type of tournament than what we're used to in record of ragnarok expect better fights toward the end of the tournament but yes that's going to be the chapter hope you guys enjoyed the video and i'll catch you guys in the next one peace